Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before we get into it with our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, please go like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Christy Brown on the podcast. She's coming to us from Texas. She's an IFBB pro. And yeah, she's on here to just share her journey and talk all things health and fitness. But most importantly, she is our current guest. Christy, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Well, we're not even going to get into the weather because you already told me like you're just daydreaming about Florida still a little bit and I don't even want to get that in my head. So before we just, you know, put ourselves in a very bad place, well, just to start things off, give us your backstory and what inspired and motivated you to adapt this lifestyle and how it led to where you're at right now. Um, so I am actually a master's um, IFBB pro competitor. I went pro in 2021. Um, I'm 42 and a half and I did not even start working out. I don't even think I stepped a foot into the gym until I was like maybe 33, 34. Um, grew up really religious background where, you know, sports, hey, I'm from the Midwest too. So sports, um, organized sports were kind of satanic. So (laughs) did not even like, um, step foot into the gym. And my husband and I actually met in the gym and he kind of like has pushed me to where I am. Um, I was kind of a fatty for a while. I really didn't like have really any success, like, um, coming up with any kind of like manageable weight loss program or anything like that. Um, genetically, I know a lot of people will think, Oh, it's genetics. It's genetics. I mean, genetically, I do have some, some gifts, my back, which actually does not flipping matter at all. Um, in my division, they asked me to like cover it, but, um, I have to work really, really hard for like, you know, the rest of my physique. Um, I fell in love with bodybuilding and didn't even think about competing at all until everybody at my gym was just like, Hey, do you compete? Do you compete? And I was like, well, I might as well try it. And I ended up going pro in my first year, which is like really kind of unheard of, but, um, it just, it just was in my cards, but I ended up going pro in Pittsburgh at masters nationals. Um, I took first place in my age group and then I actually took second place in the age group beneath me, but that was enough to get me pro. And then this year for whatever reason, the universe has decided that they've chosen me to, um, represent in Romania in eight weeks. And I'm going to the masters Olympia, um, which is, I think this is the first one in 15, 17 years. So that is what I'm in prep for right now. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I got started. Um, I started coaching, um, about really two years ago and I coach lifestyle and, and then I have about 10 to 12 competitors that I coach as well. So, um, a lot of them are masters competitors as well. That's just where I kind of like, I guess I have that that specialty and my girls are doing really, really well. I've had a couple almost go pro this year. Um, it's just the beginning. So it's, it's going to be a fun year. It's a very stressful year, but it's going to be a fun year for sure. Well, excuse me as I'm still recovering from the shock of you announcing that you're a master's competitor because I've been shocked a couple of times on this podcast and I'm 28. And if you would have asked me how old you think I'm, I would have said probably like 30, 31. I I don't, so I, I, and most of the time I lie if someone asks me that just to make them feel good. But like for you, li- literally, I'm just like, okay, what now? Do you get that a lot? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I and I love that. Um, and I'm very transparent about like, you know, I'm not somebody who's ever going to like come out and be like, I'm a natural athlete or anything like that, obviously. <laughs> like I'm enhanced. But um, when people tell me that, I like to joke all the time and be like, oh, it's a lot of Botox and a lot of drugs. It's fine. But, you know, um, I I think it's just you know, I'm, I'm a very, I'm, I'm at peace (laughs) with my life too. And I really, um, really centered. And I think that it has a lot to do with, with maybe the way that I, my aging process. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Well, I mean, genetics got to play a little bit of it. So, you know, if maybe we could swap genetics a little bit, that would be great. But you know, unfortunately that's not the case. I'm still waiting for that drug to be invented where you can just swap genes with someone, but you know, it, unfortunately it has not happened yet, but 
there's so many myths about the sport of bodybuilding in the general public. I mean, you mentioned bodybuilding to someone and they have, you know, so many different beliefs about the sport and it's hard to sort of navigate and find out, you know, what it's really all about. Did you have struggle with that at all when you were getting started, just not really knowing that much about the sport? Because there's so much out there that like really, I think drags people away from it. I do. I think that one of the biggest misconceptions is um, how very, very difficult it is. Um, I think that like, I have a lot of clients that will first come to me and it's almost like offensive when people, especially when women, when they will meet with me and be like, well, I don't want to get too bulky. And I'm like, I would trade a kidney if I could get bulky. Like, do you understand how difficult that is? It's impossible. Like it takes so much outside enhancing help and, and years and years and hours. I mean, it's just like, so I think a lot of people are afraid of the term bodybuilding, um, especially women. Now I'm going to say this from a woman's perspective. I'm not going to say this really from a man's perspective because I don't know, but from a woman's perspective, when I have a client come in, they, um, they're, they're first, Oh, I just want to get tone. And I'm like, everyone that steps foot into a gym that is starting a journey, I don't care whether you're doing orange theory. I don't care if you're doing bodybuilding in a gym, every single person that is stepping foot into a gym and is trying to make their body better. Somehow you are bodybuilding, you're building a body. Um, I think that there's a misconception where you're immediately thinking, okay, I'm going to look like Arnold. It's, it's not that way. Bodybuilding is just a part of making our bodies that God gave us as healthy as possible and as strong as possible. So we can live as long as possible. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that there is a huge misconception about that. I think that there's another huge misconception out there about the use of enhancements and the use of drugs. And it seems like, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that you've come across this too with a lot of, um, more than I'd like to admit if I'm being completely honest. (laughs) Yeah. But it's like the last couple of years, it's just been under just attack. Um, we just heard that this morning, we just heard that one of the guys that we just love and follow um, Joe, um, from Germany, like he just passed away. And I'm like, it's just become so prevalent that, you know, there's so much damage and death and loss being occurring in my industry. And I think that that's kind of, you know, putting a bad taste in people's mouths as well about bodybuilding. So I hate that. I, I hate it because I've had nothing negative impact my life about the sport. It has enhanced my life. It's made my life better. Um, yeah, it's hard reps hard. Um, you know, saying no to food is hard. I th- and I'm with you. I, that's the hardest part for me. That is by far, I, I'll go in the gym and work out two, three hours a day. It's no problem. I will pose and hurt and, you know, and do all of the things, but I'm, I'm a foodie too. So that's really, really hard for me. The thing that drives me the most crazy is then when I talk to some guests and they're like, yeah, I also watch the food network a lot when I'm on prep and I do all that stuff. And I was like, that is torture. Like I don't get I don't get that type of level of it. So again, that's just the dedication, the drive that I will luckily for me, at least never have, because that's just, you know, I don't, again, more power to the people that do it. But I mean, there's so much talk about, you know, the physical impact of the sport and how it helps you physically, but mentally it's a hundred times more important. I don't care what anyone says. How has this journey helped improve you mentally? Because that is something that I think will last for far longer than any other thing. I know I'm like looking out of the corner of my eye at my husband and I'm like, does it improve me mentally? <laughs> he, he will be the first one to tell you. Um, I turn into some sort of like ogre, some sort of bipolar dragon that emerges. He never knows. He, he tiptoes a lot the second that prep hits. And 100% minus food, minus food circles. Um, I have a little bit harder of a food journey, probably than most people in prep as well. Um, well, I am, I'm a macros coach. And I follow macros. I follow macros all the way up until stage day. Um, now the past years though, I have, I don't do a meal plan ever. I will kind of put myself on a meal plan and eat the same things. But I mean, the day that I stepped on stage last year, I mean, I was still eating oatmeal with M&Ms in it. I mean, I just, that's, I work everything in and that's my philosophy with my girls and I'm, my philosophy with you you need to drink a beer every day and you need to hot, eat a hot dog every day, even if you're not okay. every day. Not I'm going to be completely honest. It's like, it's like once every a day, week. Work yeah. it in, <laughs> okay. work it in because then you'll remove the taboo from hot dogs and beer. But 
this year, I, I also suffer a lot with intestinal problems. I've been diagnosed with Crohn's. I've had that for years. Um, competing and having Crohn's disease is a challenge in itself. Um, I got really, really bad through my off season this last year and started having worse, um, worse episodes that were lasting longer, ended up going in and having some allergy testing done and um, some legit allergy testing, not like internet allergy testing and took six weeks. And I, I have found out, I guess like it's, it's great information. You want to know the information to make yourself feel better. But then at the same time, you're like, well, damn it. Why did I do this? Because now it's making it even harder because now I'm basically allergic to everything. And I'm this prep I can pretty much eat like five foods. So I'm living on corn and bananas and almonds and shrimp. And it's been extremely challenging because trust me, as much as you love beer and hot dogs, I would, I would do some sinful things with like a whole lot of cookies. So it's, it's been a huge, huge challenge. And mentally that's a huge challenge for me. Now the positive of mental it, I guess it just teaches you discipline and anything that we can do in our lives to like create habits of discipline and practice discipline, practice, um, restraint, practice, um, all of those things that make us mentally stronger. Um, I, I believe that that's a great practice to have. I don't feel like it's anything that should be done for an extended period of time. That's why prep is for a short period of time. Um, you need a mental break. You need, you know, you actually need times when you're nice to people around you and prep probably isn't those times, but mentally I do feel like it just helps you a discipline in life and it helps you be able to stand up for what you want to do. Not only just for like, you know, taking my shrimp to the restaurant while my girls are picking out after a show, but, um, also being willing to like stand up for what you're doing, because there's a lot of scrutiny that will come. You read my mind perfectly. I was going to ask, what was your friends and family's reaction when you announced them? Like, Hey, I want to give bodybuilding a try. Oh, not, not great. I, um, not great at all. Like my husband is my number one fan. He is like, um, he's everything. Um, and then I do have close friends in my life that are really, you know, supportive of me. Um, I don't have a real, real great relationship with my family, my, my parents, but a lot of that goes back to like what I said at the beginning, my upbringing. Um, it's, a hard pill to swallow. I think even less about the food of even less about the working out and the discipline when it comes to that, but more about the fact that I'm pretty much like, I have a 16 year old daughter and I am supposed to be, you know, the model, you know, mother of, of morals and ethical, you know, well-being. And here I am stepping on stage with my ass hanging out. So it's, it's a lot for my parents to, um, to swallow. So that part, I don't have a lot of support of, but I have the support that I need. So, so I do good. And that's, you know, that's great. Just even having that one person of support really does mean the difference. But when it comes to preps, a lot of people say that their first prep is their hardest as was your first prep the hardest or is it still, it's got, it's gotten even harder as it's gone on. Oh yeah. This has been the hardest prep I've ever done just because of the newfound allergies. Um, my first prep was the easiest prep I ever did. Um, I wasn't with the coach that I'm with now. I was with another coach. He was, um, not, he did not compete in the league that I was competing in. Um, so, and he was, I don't, he didn't have any other girls. He had, he had no other competitors except one man. So the fact that I did so well with him, I did one show with him. The fact that I did really, really well with him was um, probably a lot of luck, probably just a lot of, um, I don't know, who knows what that was. Now, the second that I switched over to Dylan with Bear Aesthetics, is he's my coach, um, he runs a tight ship and you know, he's very detailed. Um, everything is laid out. He's very good about the macros and all that stuff too, but um, I just realized then, wow, this is actually way more serious than my first prep was. And that's when, I mean, with him, I immediately went pro. I mean, he knows, he knows what he's doing. So 
it has never been that hard, but it's because my off season, I've always done really well. Now this last off season, I lost my mind a little bit. Um, but I did six shows last year and that was a lot. And I was in prep from, I pretty much didn't eat out or didn't have a life from February. Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah. Super Bowl Sunday last year until August the 22nd. Wait, you started on Super Bowl Sunday? Yes. I started my prep on Super Bowl Sunday. You couldn't wait until the day after? I know. I think I did eat that day. Yeah. I went, I went to Buffalo brothers and I had Buffalo wings and I had pizza. And then we, the next day, I started prep, but I didn't get no nothing until August the 22nd. So it was a long year of restriction. And then I did not follow my reverse extremely well. I did put on 40 pounds this last off season, but I needed to. My, um, you know, my feedback last year was, I mean, I placed second at Pittsburgh last year. I almost won that pro show. Um, And then it's like after Pittsburgh, I did, I think three more. And it just, my physique just kind of kept going down, down, down. Cause it was like, my body was like, you're done. Um, so I did go in with the intention of, I need to put on a lot of size. Um, I, they told me I needed bigger shoulders, bigger glutes. So, I mean, I went in knowing that I've never gained that much in an off season before. It was a little scary. Um, so I have a lot to lose. You know, however, my body's responded really well. I've been in prep for nine weeks now and I'm down 25 pounds. So no, actually 30, almost 30 pounds. So I probably have maybe eight pounds to go um, with eight weeks left. So I'm sitting in a good position, but this prep has been so freaking hard because I'm on such low calories already and such high cardio. So, well, I also love to play devil's advocate. You mentioned that your back was one thing that really, really took off. What's been one body part that you've just had to drag behind? Glutes always it's always and i mean i hit glutes hard i i'm very good um about activity i have an excellent excellent so dylan is my um he's my coach he's my macros coach he does all my nutrition and then i have a coach that writes my training for me out of hobbs new mexico deloitte landreth um he's really great about activating certain areas i mean i literally kill my glutes and it's glutes and hamstring tie-ins and then front, front deltoids. So, um, those are my two lagging areas always. Um, we'll see, we'll see this year. I mean, so far it looks like I've had some really good growth, but never really know until it's time to compare me to the others, you know, what's your relationship like with cardio? Cause that's the word. That's my least favorite thing out of all of this. And when I say cardio, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, those times when you're just about to cry cause you just got to go oh, yeah. for that walk and stuff. How do you deal with that? I'm good with it until it gets raised. So it's like if, and honestly, I need car. I like cardio a lot as, excuse me, as long as it's under 30 minutes a day, like if it's under 30 minutes, then I feel like mentally it helps me. Um, there's something mental about it, but the second that it starts raising, then I'm like, Oh my God, I can't, I can't handle my life. Like, um, I'm up to 45 minutes a day right now, six days a week. Um, it's really like, it's really tough right now. And I will switch it up. I go back and forth. I'll do spin sometimes. Sometimes I do elliptical. Sometimes I'll just walk in fine on the treadmill, but, um, it's a lot. It's really a lot right now. And I I'm fine. Like right now I've, I've come to peace with the 45 minutes. Um, but it's been here for two weeks. So it's like, I'm okay with it. Every time I open my update from Dill, I'm always like, if he raises it, I will literally like throw a fit, like, like, like a three-year-old. And then, um, I I'm really down about it for about three or four days. And then I'm like, okay, suck it up. You got to do it. You know? Well, the record on this show is two and a half hours a day, oh, seven yeah. days a week. And like, that's the point where I'm just like, no. you got, you got to really start to rethink your priorities. Then oh, no. if that's what you're being, honest. I would have to wake up at like 2 AM. I don't yeah. even know how people do that with their lives. I, I don't know. Like I've never, I'm thinking the highest cardio that I've ever had to do, I think was an hour, maybe 65 minutes, maybe. And that was like maybe seven days a week. But, um, I have the same philosophy though, as my coach, I use cardio as a tool, um, in off season. I try to take it down to hardly anything, um, because car, your body will respond to cardio a lot. Like it responds to food. And if you leave cardio in, in your off season, if you leave cardio in, 
for a long time, then your body's going to adapt to it. So you're just going to have to keep doing more and more and more and more. So I try my best to like give myself cardio breaks, things like that, because I sure as hell don't want to be somebody doing two hours of cardio. I don't, I don't have time for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't, honestly, if, if you do, you need to honestly do something else with your life. Then if you have that much time set for cardio, but like you mentioned, you have a handful of foods that you can eat. Please tell me that you're trying to at least mix things up a little bit. Like you add some flavor to it. How do you try to like, not keep yourself from going crazy? Cause I was almost going crazy just hearing you talk about it. Yeah, literally, I will tell you my, like, here's what I basically eat every day. Um, and right now we just went to, you know, we went to California and our friends, um, he made, he made me one morning, um, something, but he gave me corn tortillas and I was like, mother of God, like I totally forgot I can have corn tortillas. So I've kind of like switched over the past couple of days, but like every single morning, I mean, like shrimp, vegan cheese, grits and corn tortillas. And then for lunch, I'm eating, um, shrimp and corn flakes. And then for dinner, I'm eating like shrimp and corn flakes or kick cereal with like some marshmallows on it. And then I usually get like a banana or an apple with almond butter. And then I get like a protein of plant-based protein shake, or sometimes I throw in like grits with almond butter again for a snack. Like that's pretty much my life right now. And I get a refeed once a week, usually where my carbs go up a hundred and I'm like, "Hmm, great. Give me three more bananas. Love that for me. So it's, it's a lot, but, um, I try my best just to like, remember, okay, this is only eight weeks. This is only eight weeks. It's only eight weeks. And we are really good about like making it about the experience. Like we have, we're really, really, we love EDM. Like we're huge EDM fans. I don't care how old I am. I will rave to the grave. And we, um, go to festivals a lot. We're going to see Elenium tonight. We just really fill our lives with a lot of experiences. Um, that way I can kind of transfer my, my food love to like something else, I guess, and just kind of make it more about the experience. And, you know, and I also do a lot of online shopping. That helps too. I I will say at least mentally, but like, let's be honest, you're not the average looking woman, especially like when you're going out to music festivals, like tonight, I always find it fascinating how like, it's almost like a mini celebrity where you just draw people's attention just because it's human nature when they see something that's not of the normal, just be, you know, just drawn to it a little bit. How do you deal with that? Because a lot of people, it's, it's weird for them. It is. Um, I've talked to my husband about this. Like we were actually, we're just talking about the reaction of people. I'm pretty, um, I'm a pretty confident and like pretty, like, I don't really care. I act like I don't, I don't care so much. Some people are really nice. Some people are like, Oh my God, you look amazing. Oh my God. Like you, your muscles, blah, 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 blah. But then like going to Sam's or Costco or whatever. And it's like, I'm walking through and we're leaving and we own a gym. So we, you know, often will like be wearing gym clothes and I'm going where I am. And just the negativity of like, you know, the Karens that are like walking by with their carts. And, um, that some people just like negatively, like outspoken. Like, um, I was at Walmart like a couple of weeks ago and I'm just like walking, I'm like, not even doing anything like walking, dragging a cart. And these two women walk by me and the one's like, Oh my God, that is so gross. And I'm like, what? I mean, also when it comes down to the posing aspect of the sport, so many people do not understand that for a lot of my guests, that is the hardest thing on there. I mean, it's the hardest. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. And we get that reaction almost all the time. What was your experience like when you first got started and what's it like now? Because as much as you can practice it, I mean, you can never be perfect at it. Oh no. And I'm terrible at practicing it. Like I tell all of my girls, like you need to practice even in the off season, you need to be practicing, you know, four to five times a week, at least 10 minutes a day. I'm terrible about it because it hurts so bad. And I'm not, I'm so jealous of like these females that like have this like, so in my division, you have to have this like severe lower back arch and this like major flexibility there. Um, I have a lot of muscle. Like I told you, my back's really genetically um, strong. I have a lot of muscle in my lower back that I've not real. But when I started my journey in fitness, I did a lot of CrossFit for a couple of years and it's a lot of deadlifting. It's a lot of that weird, you know, movements. And I don't know if that bulked my lower back a lot. I don't know, but I don't have the flexibility in my lower back to have that insane arch that like is the key 
for bikini posing. Um, I also don't have like a naturally tight core. Um, I mean, I have abs, but I think a lot to do with like my intestinal problems. I have a lot of like, um, just a bigger, a, a thicker ab, um, frame. And it's, it's a hard, hard thing to do. Posing is insane. I think a lot of people just think it's like us getting up there and we're just like flaunting about, um, I wear heel, like I have <laughs> my husband, <laughs> he's like, okay, I have two different identities. I'm basically like a 13 year old boy or a stripper. Like I don't have it's some in between, but I do wear heels. Like I'm not stupid in heels. Um, but it's just every single movement is so calculated and every single movement. It's like, you have to be thinking about nine different areas of your body and flexing this, relaxing this and turning this. And, and it's, it's just so uncomfortable. Um, I have my girls, you know, I will help with posing and stuff for some of my girls. I'm not that most excellent posing coach, but I have them. So I'll tell them, you know, sometimes you have to hold a pose for a minute, two minutes. I literally had to hold my front pose in Miami last year. I, and my freaking last name is Brown. So I was right on the edge. I'm not behind other girls. I'm right there on the edge. And when you don't get first call outs, you have to wait. And I think I held, he said that he times me. I held my front pose for like seven minutes. And it was almost to the point where I was like, I'm done. Like, give me last place. I'm off. And it is the most uncomfortable part of competing. It is, it's painful. It really is. And I mean, yeah. how have you tried to somewhat do the conditioning part of posing? Because that's like you said, one thing people don't understand is just the amount of time. Like if you're on there for seven minutes, nobody can really hold it like that. But how do you yeah. try to at least improve your conditioning? Because that to me is the most impressive thing out of any of the posing really. For a bikini, um, the most, honestly, it's back flexibility. I, what my routine is for this is I use a yoga wheel. I try my best just to keep my back super, super loose. I practice pretty much every day, um, making that back arch better and then core control, like doing vacuums, um, because you have to hold that core tight. And I think a lot of people, and I have a lot of girls that when they check in with me, they're just like, oh my God, I'm so, I'm so bloated. I'm, but I'm like, the second that you get backstage, even us, even pros, like you're going to walk back there and be like, we're all got our bellies hanging out. Like we just ate a Big Mac. But it's like, if you get on stage, man, you have to pull your shit together. And it's like, everything is just tight and held in. So all of that practice of doing that is done in preparation. I mean, you have to learn how to do vacuums. You have to learn how to pull your core in. you have to learn how to do that and do it often. Um, I have a lot of friends that use waist trainers and things like that, like during their seasons. Um, I don't necessarily just because I feel like it would make me depend heavily upon that. So like, and I want to be able to actually physically be able to have control of that and it will help me more. But with the bikini division, it's it's honestly a lot to do with back flexibility and core control. If you have those two things, then you're going to do well on stage. And what was that moment like when they announced your name and you realized, are you kidding me? I'm a pro now. Yeah, that was, um, there's two moments in my life where I'm like, this is so freaking surreal. Um, I almost went pro at my second show. My first um national show was junior Nats. And that was, I was cocky. I had won my, I won first place at the Phil Heath and almost won the overall. And then I went to California NorCal championships and I split the overall with, um, Ariel Barley and then went to junior Nats cocky, but I was old and I didn't understand okay, well, I just, um, I just split the overall at NorCal, then I'll be fine. I'll go pro. And I did get first call outs, which is a huge feat for it to be, you know, a 40 year old girl, um, against these twenties and I got eighth place and I was just like devastated. So ended up going to my next show was I think universe and I won second place. So I missed my card by one spot. And then at Pittsburgh, um, it was just so surreal. I, it's, it's like a moment I'll never forget. I mean, hearing them call my name, I was just like, oh my God, this isn't even real. It's not even real. And it was just 
it was the moment that my whole life changed, everything changed. Um, you know, at that moment, it's like, it gave me so much like gas in my tank to, I guess, believe in myself, to do the things that I had always thought, okay, I'm going to do this shortly thereafter my coaching business really, you know, it's like, I just went full force on it and I was like, I'm going to do this. And I really have done it and I've done it well. Um, we decided to open up our gym. Like, um, a lot of things just took off from that aspect. Um, now (laughs) that probably was like, yeah, that's awesome. But when they announced, so I, I, um, applied to go to the Olympia this year. Um, this was an invite only. So this is not like the regular Olympia that's in, um, you know, Orlando. So, um, I applied, I shot my shot and I was like, yeah, I'm going to at least apply. It's, you know, I probably would never be chosen. Um, when they, and I never got an email. I never, I've never heard nothing. It was like a live announcement on their YouTube channel. And I was training a client and I had her like hooked into this machine and she was like doing reps. And then they started announcing, you know, okay. And the bikini athletes are, and when they said my name, I was like, I just left her like in the machine. And I just, I mean, I literally lost my freaking mind and I had probably about two to three weeks of like imposter syndrome. I was just kind of like, are maybe there's another Christy Brown, like, I'm just going to hold off. What if, you know, what if there's another one? And then sure enough, I got the email, you know, notification and stuff. So, I mean, that honestly has been more, this year has been more of like, I can't even believe this more than even going pro. So it's, this is a lot. This is a lot this year. <laughs> and when it comes to your coaching, what's your favorite thing about being a coach? And what's your least favorite thing about being a coach? Um, I think my favorite thing about being a coach is just, I love, I love transformations. I really do. And I love physical transformations. I do love that, but I love mental transformations. Um, I love seeing people understand that this is not just a six week thing, but this is like a lifetime, um, that it's something that can work with your life. That's what I love about macro coaching is that you can eat hot dogs and beer every day and you still can reach your goals and you can make it work. You can go on vacation. Um, I love it. I was a dental hygienist for 23 years and just recently completely quit that. Um, I hated my job every day for 23 years. I like went and worked for someone else. I hated what I did. Um, it just wasn't rewarding to me. Um, I just, I hated it. And now it's like, I have 5am clients, you know, and I work until 5pm and I love it. I love training people. I love seeing them be able to do things that they never thought that they would ever be able to do. I love seeing their bodies change in ways that they never thought that they would, you know, that they would see. Um, The worst part about being a coach is I would say the prep coach attribute of that is like when you see, you know, people have expectations, you know, and, and I try to always set realistic expectations for people, but still, I mean, you can have girls say, Oh, I, I don't expect to win. I don't expect to be first. I just, this is a bucket list item for me. I just really want to just get on stage and prove that I can do this. My heart breaks if they don't do well. Like I live everything I put my whole life. I mean, I probably don't give my family, you know, the part of me that I need to give them because I'm fully, fully committed to being the best coach to every single client that comes to me. Um, So as much as you try to set them up for the expectation of, listen, this is a hard show. I don't want you to have these unrealistic expectations. Everybody still wants to be successful, you know, and having to hold them you know, the, sh- the shambles of, okay, you didn't, you didn't do well. And I don't know why you didn't do well because you should have done well sort of situation. That part is really, really hard on me because I, I grieve when they grieve, you know? When I love to also talk about post-show because like you said, one, this last year you gained what 40 pounds in your post-show and that's hard for so many people mentally. Oh, yeah. How do you deal with that mental side of it? Because, and it's also hard too, because you'll, people might see you outside the gym and they're like, Hey, do you even like compete anymore? Because <laughs> that to me is the worst thing you can ever say to any of these people. So yeah. don't ever do that first of all, if you can, but <laughs> how do you deal with the mental side of like, you're not gonna be able to maintain that look 24 seven. 
Yes, and you shouldn't. You should not. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's like not, it's not healthy to be in that low body fat. Um, so there's two sides of this. Um, there's the calculated, you know, the calculated gain. Um, and that is what I do. Now, the first two years of competing, I was afraid. I really was. And I probably didn't put on more than 10 pounds um, postseason those first two years. Um, I had a coach though, and I have a really great relationship with my coach. Um, and I think it was more about like trusting myself. It was like, I used to be fat, you know, and I'm like it, what if I can't ever get back here? That was what, you know, I was most afraid of trusting my coach for him to be like, you are going to get back here. This is necessary, you know? So like the third year of competing, I put on 25 pounds, um, and it did, it came off and I actually was, my stage weight was less than it ever been. So this year I wasn't afraid. I knew what had to be done. We, but I also have a coach that is very good about communicating. Um, you know, if I'm having problems mentally with like, okay, I'm, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling. And it is difficult. And post-show is like legit. Um, it doesn't matter how many years that you compete. Post-show blues is like legit. You, you go for so long with like everybody excited for you. You have a goal. You're, you're going to step on stage. You're going to do this. You're this. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, here we are in post season. There's no show date. And now you have just this goal of, okay, let's get strong. Yeah. But then, you know, you, you just kind of look like, like shit too. So it's, I think it takes just practice, um, to kind of, be okay with it. Um, I have two different wardrobes, honestly, like I have a whole oversized tee wardrobe and then I have a lot of crop tops. So, um, now as far as like amateurs, I have found that girls that are in prep for a very, very long time do not handle their post-show. They just don't because they've been restricted for so long. Their bodies are usually an in insulin resistance. Um, they are just like, screw this. I don't want to track anymore. I want to go on 10 vacations. Um, the most thing that I can tell those girls is I'm like, if you're going to eat like an asshole, well, at least lift. Like if you're going to eat and put on 10 pounds in, you know, two weeks, then let's at least like go to the gym and and lift as heavy as possible, you know, and put forth that effort. The downfall comes when you just give up on everything and then you put on all this weight and you don't even step foot into the gym. So, um, handling post-show, I try to talk to my girls <laughs> a lot. <laughs> like if I haven't heard from them in a couple of days, then I'm on them. Um, I set everybody up with a really good reverse plan, but do they always follow it? No, because they're ready to go eat and go on vacation and stuff like that. But then usually because I have such a good relationship with them within a week or two, they're checking back in and we're reining it back in and we're getting a plan together. So Handling it in in post show in off season, I think it just comes with years of practice and getting comfortable with the fact of trusting yourself and knowing that you can take it back off. Um, I have a little bit more pressure on me. I know I've told my husband the last couple of weeks. I'm just like, I just want to get fat. I don't care about this anymore. I'm tired of this, and he's like well, we can't do that. Remember, cause we own a gym, you know, so it kind of does help with us where we have this, like, you know, this career where we kind of, you can't have people come in and do a tour when I look like I'm on my 600 pound life. So it's like, I'm, you know, I have to look like I own a gym. So that kind of helps me a little bit, but yeah, post show is hard, dude. Like it's really hard. You, you just have to fall in love with, with a strength at that point and realize, Hey, you know what? It's going to come around again and I'm going to look good again in the summer. <laughs> well, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, someone that you guys followed had passed away and there's been a lot of that recently. What are some changes that you would like to see in the sport of bodybuilding going on in the future? Because I do think there need to be some changes made, but I, you know, I like to hear everyone's opinion of what, ex what specifically they would like to see change. Yeah. Um, specifically, I don't care about, um, steroids. I really don't. Me like, neither. If they want, if whoever wants to use it, let them use it. Like, I don't care about that. Um, it's at your own risk. And I don't feel like that should be on the shoulders of any kind of league or organization where it's their fault. I mean, it's, it is what it is. I mean, like, 
use them, don't use them, whatever. I feel like the changes that would need to, that I do like seeing, and one of the changes actually has taken place like recently um, in the men's physique category. I think this is a great, great, great thing where they're like starting to have weight, um, weight to caps and weight weigh-ins. Um, I don't know exactly how that's going to play out in the pros because, you know, we don't compete for height. We compete for division. Um, but I do believe like they just did this where they started the wellness division, like a couple of years ago with women. I feel like there is, especially in men, there's that gray line right now. These guys, um, in men's physique, I mean, they look like freaking beasts backstage. And I'm like, these guys are men's physique. Like this is insane. So I think having a little bit more, you know, um, guidelines, parameters on what they are looking for more in that category is better. Um, I really, really wish like back in COVID and I mean, this may be, um, petty and stupid, but I love food. Remember, yep. um, back in COVID, when COVID happened, they started doing this new thing where they would do like prejudging and finals group together. I wish that that would become like a standard thing because I hate not getting off stage, you know, until I hate my girls, like not getting off stage till one and 2 AM in the morning, um, you know, and they're starving and they just want a freaking cheeseburger. So those things, I don't know. I just wish that the time constraints and things like that would change a little bit, but I do love how they are putting more emphasis on having more, I guess, standards and like specifics on what they're actually looking for in the divisions. I think that they're trying to do that a little bit more in bikini. They are really trying to have more of a, a concrete line between bikini and wellness. Um, the lines have been blurred so much over the past couple of years where it's like, these are the checklist items of what you're shooting for. These are what you need to change your body to look like. And, but then basically whoever wins the Olympia, that's who you need to look like. But then say somebody else wins the Olympia the next year, you're like, well, crap, I was trying to look like her, you know? So I do like that they are trying to come up with a little bit more, you know, guidelines for us. It does help. Well, I mean, the worst thing for me is I've heard stories of people who compete in shows and they do two divisions and they win in both divisions. And it's like that, that kind of not takes fair. away. Well, for, no, first of all, it's not fair. And it's like, doesn't that kind of take away your entire criteria for the divisions? Then if someone can win both, like that means that there's not really that much of a difference really in the divisions then. So I don't, I don't know. It like, is, I, But at, then at the same time, it's like, there's not a, it, and you're actually, you, you kind of like nailed something right there. Um, there's not like a, like a qualification, especially with the amateurs. Um, you know, it's like, whoever freaking shows up, like as long as you have like, my mom could show up tomorrow and put on a bikini. And as long as the bikini is like, okay for that division. And let's say like two people show up in her class, my mom wins second place. I mean, like there's no like qualification, which kind of sucks. Um, I do kind of wish that they would do that. It would be more fair because then, you know, you have especially girls, there's a lot of cross girls where we'll do like wellness or bikini. And, and I will tell you right now, like I am very blunt when people come and, um, they consult with me about coaching, I have a ton of girls that will consult with me and be like, well, I think I'm wellness. And I'm like, no, you're really just fat. So you just need to lose a lot of weight. And I feel like if there was a little bit more of like a qualification, like even at check-in or something, um, no, you don't qualify for this division. That would help that a lot. And that would strip that down a little bit of that like crossover, you know? Yeah. I, c I couldn't agree more. And I would love to have you on in a year to sort of just see what you're up to. Where would you like to be at personally a year from today? Oh my gosh. Well, I would love to have won this uh, master's Olympia and, you know, be living the dream. Um, but here's the deal. Even if I don't, at least I'm still the top 21 in the world. So there we are. Um, I, in a year from now, you know, honestly, I hope that I hope I do very well at the Olympia. I'm going, my plan for this year would be do the Olympia, maybe one more show, maybe not. Um, and then just go right back into off season. I really enjoyed my off season. Um, I really enjoyed being able to live and I love where we are in our life. I love that I'm growing my business. Um, I've got a lot of things coming up down the pike. Um, you know, 
really wanting to grow more with the gym and stuff like that. And a year from now, I'd love to be going back to the Olympia again. Hopefully they choose me again. That would be amazing. And hopefully I just keep getting better and better. I'm, I have no plans to stop. I'll be 43 this year and no plans to stop. So that is great. And I mean, lastly, when it comes to opening a gym, what's one thing that surprised you the most about owning your own gym? How stupid people are when it comes to technology. Honestly, like I'm, we have a full, like, um, just talking to people on this podcast alone has made me realize how stupid some people are with technology. So yeah, I know I'm just like, our gym is a 24 seven facility and you have to sign up online. Um, you have to get a barcode for entry and I'm just like, y'all, how how are you making it through school? I I don't know. So that has been the, the most surprising thing. And then like, honestly, the lack of, the lack of like, respect people have for like gym equipment like it's insane to me i'm just like i treat it like church you know i'm just like so respectful of any gym i've ever belonged to and i'm just oh my gosh it's it's just insanity <laughs> i will just say everyone re-rack your damn weights i'm telling you like oh my gosh i can't the yes. worst is like when people pull out like some guy thinks he's going to like roll like a 140 pound dumbbell and then he barely gets it off even the rack and then he just gives up and he doesn't even try to put it back. Doesn't put it back. I'm like, yeah. if you can, if you can take it off, put it on in our gym, we have, I love our kids. Like we have, we live in a small town and we've got a lot of teenage kids that come to our gym, um, which I love because what you hit on right when we started where you said oh, great. It's five of us, you know, doing this. And and thanks coach. These kids, like they all think they're going to the O they all do. Um, they all think that they're Nick Walker and, and, you know, C bomb and they all drop their pants and pose like in the middle of my gym. And I'm like, <laughs> I love this, but I don't. Um, but at the same time, I love it. I love seeing that they have found the safety and this like refuge. Um, at our gym. I love to be a part of that. I love to be able to change, you know, to change that. I've got so many of these kids that they're paying for their own gym memberships, you know? And when I was 15 and 16 years old, I couldn't even afford Taco Bell. So, I mean, I love that they are investing in this part of their lives. And I love to be able to be a part of that. Just give me back my 15, 16 year old metabolism though. Good God. Right. I know. Just Same. after all sports practices, just going having a burger almost all the time, having a shake too on oh. it, and not even having to worry about it. Oh yeah, you don't even know how many of them like um like DoorDash like pizzas to the gym, and I'm just like, I hate you so much. <laughs> oh yeah, those are the, those are the worst. But I mean, again, Christy, I cannot thank you enough for coming on and sharing your journey with us. And I'll leave a link down below for your gym if anyone's interested in the area. Oh. I think we do have quite a few listeners in the Texas area and. Yeah, I cannot thank you enough, and it was great talking to you, and I I look forward to seeing how you do later on the rest of the year. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. And all right, everyone, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the Spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone.